Hi, William. Hello, Axel. How's it going? Great. Uh, can you tell us a few words about yourself and about the tool you want to show us? Yeah, so I'm William, and the tool I'll be, I'll be showing today is NannyML. I'm a co-founder of the tool. Uh, and prior to NannyML, uh, I was a data scientist, and I had a consulting company which focused on machine learning. And what we did there is that we took on projects, machine learning projects, data science projects, uh, that we after also get to deploy the machine learning model. And we developed some unique insights and expertise about what happens to machine learning models post-deployment because there's a lot of things that can go wrong and that make machine learning models fail. And we decided to build a product around that. And that's how NannyML got born. And with NannyML, the best way to describe it is that it's actually a tool to do post-deployment data science. So it's like the scikit-learn, but instead of training your machine learning models and validating them, it's really for existing machine learning models and trying to figure out why they, why they are failing and how to fix them. Well, that's pretty interesting. I'd love to see the demo. Yeah, uh, I suggest that we just hop straight into it. That's okay. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, quickly share my screen here. Uh, so NannyML is a Python library. I've already installed it in this environment. Um, and we can just import pandas because that's what data scientists use. A quick version here, it's the 0 0.3.1 version. Um, and then we can just load in the data and I'll quickly explain what type of use case that we're looking at here. It's a loan default data set. So this is basically a use case where we try to predict uh, whether customers will be able to pay back their car loan, yes or no. Uh, and every row here is a customer. And as, we, as you can see, we have a little bit of information about um, their loan application, basically what the value of the car is, their salary range, um, and also a little bit of other information there. But what's most importantly is that we also know for a part of this data set, uh, whether the customer was able to re repay the loan back or, or, or not. And this data is typically used for training. Um, the machine learning model specifically here, it's the, the test set. Uh, and we know who repaid it. And then we also have the model outputs. And if we compare both, we can actually get the performance of the machine learning model. And we also have like a partition column here at the end, which denotes the difference between reference and analysis. And the analysis is basically the period after the machine learning model has been deployed. So we have a timestamp here. Uh, and after using the training data, machine learning model is ready, we deploy it. And then here, fairly recent, uh, we see what it's been happening in production. And because this use case specifically, the target is delayed, that means we only know after one year or a few months whether a customer was able to repay back their car loan, yes or no. So we don't have the ground truth. We don't have the target values in production, which makes it very hard to get an idea of how performant the machine learning model is. Um, and that's exactly what we're going to use NannyML for in this demo, is to get a view what is the performance of our machine learning model post-deployment when we don't have access to the target data. And the first thing we have to do is uh, partition the data in the reference and the analysis period. Ideally, the reference is the test data and the analysis uh, is the, the part of the data set which is uh, generated after the model has been deployed like the production data. And we can quickly extract some um, metadata, which basically is like NannyML extracting what, what are the data types of the various columns, uh, what's the column which contains the predictions, what is the target column here, and then we can do a small printout um, of what this heuristic basically gathered in terms of information about what that ML does and what it is. Um, and after that, we can just start estimating the performance and this interface looks very much like scikit-learn. So we just take an estimator, we fit it on the reference data, and then we can estimate on the entire data set what the performance is. And I'll show you here. What is CBPE? Yeah, so that's the name of the algorithm and it stands for confidence-based performance estimation. And it basically levers the, leverages the information here in the test set, um, like the model output, its probabilities, or it might be model scores. And the CBPE first calibrates these probabilities. Uh, and then it leverages them to come up with an actual prediction for the performance. And right here, we're looking at the rock AUC metric uh, and we see how it has been performing in 
on the reference data. And then after it has been deployed, we see after a few months, there is a significant drop in performance. That's also why we have this red shaded area. Um, and that is the first tell that probably our machine learning model has failed. And we have to delve into a little bit deeper of what's happening here. But you don't know the labels yet, right? So you expect that it's worse. Um, yes, exactly. So this is not the realized performance. It's just what we estimate the performance to be with our algorithm based on the information and the labels that are available um, on the test set. If you want to read up about this algorithm, it's in our documentation. I assure you link, you will link it uh, underneath the video uh, because it's a, a fairly interesting concept. It's something that we came up with and that we researched and developed. I mean, with we, the core contributors of, of many and all. Yeah, looks quite interesting. Um, yeah, and after that, um, if we know something is wrong, because we are really obsessed about model performance in the way that today, if you look at machine learning model, uh, model monitoring, there's a lot of hype about data drift. Um, but data drift might generate a lot of alerts if, the, if there is a change in distributions. And not all of these alerts might be relevant to us because if it doesn't impact the performance, are we really interested? because the machine learning model might have seen a lot of uh, similar data in the past and know how to deal with these new observations or it's quite similar. And if it's not impacted by performance, uh, we actually don't wanna get bothered by it too much. Um, but it's still interesting in an analysis to go and look at um, what the actual data drift is, how the actual data drift, what's happening with it. Um, and this is also an algorithm that, that uh, we researched and developed and it's basically, um, data reconstruction error that we visualize over time. And the same thing we do it here, it's, it's, it's basically the same uh, notion of, uh, as scikit learn where we fit a calculator on the reference data, and then we use this calculator on the entire data period. And what we basically do is we take a PCA principal uh, component analysis object that we fit um, on the reference data. And then we basically decompress um, every period to latent space, and then uh, no, we compress it to latent space, and then we decompress it again. And then we basically have the decompressed data and the actual data, and we can compare it. And that kind of gives us an error, which is data reconstruction. And if this data reconstruction error goes up, that means that the patterns in latent space have changed. Do you have so a you, question? You do this PCA on the test data, right? And then you try to reconstruct. Uh, on the an analysis part, right? And you see that yeah. actually the reconstruction error uh, for these intervals later in 2020, 2021, they are larger, right? And this is- Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah, very true. Um, and this all are us gathering clues, very high level of that something has changed uh, with the data going into the model. And then we can go delve in deeper. So we start with estimated performance, we started with um, multivariate data drift, and then we can have a look at the univariate data drift. Basically the same concept again, where we fit a calculator. Um, and we can also first, we can look at how the model output has changed because model output is basically also an aggregated uh, way, a way to aggregate model inputs. And here we see that we also have the model output changing over time, where we basically see that the predicted probabilities, the highest levels they go down a little bit, and the lowest levels, they come up a little bit. And that's a, a clear sign that, that actually data is moving towards decision boundary and that there is just more risk present in the data. And we also see uh, a change in distribution here in the first month we deployed, which is interesting because that's not something that our algorithm picked up on. And we can, we can delve into that a little bit later, but that's another way of looking high level at data changes. And then the most important part is that we can actually um, link uh, data drift or univariate feature drift back to the estimated performance. And we have a very small object for it, which is a uh, ranker. Here I just ranked all of the alerts which happened in a certain features based on number of alerts, but there is more advanced ways of to do ranking. You can rank based on feature importance, uh, rank features that only show drift uh, to exclude features that haven't drifted or only focus on those alerts that actually coincide with a drop in performance. And this is basically our feature that deals with alert fatigue and that deals with all of the alerts that might pop up, but that we're actually not really interested in because the model is still performing. 
And then we can do a lower level analysis um, where we go and actually look at the feature distributions. I might, okay, no, we can still perfectly see it. Um, and then we can have a look at, for instance, here, the car value. And we see that after this period, the actual value has gone up. These are uh, vertical joy plots. So this is, these are the quartiles. And we can actually see that um, before the first quartile used to be around 15,000 euros. And right now it's around 13,000 euros. So that is just a, a sign that we as data scientists have to take in and that we have to think about, okay, why is it that the car value has gone up? And if we combine it with the other features uh, that show alerts, for instance, here, the salary range, we also see that the lowest salary has gone up here compared to the previous periods. But most interesting though, is that the highest salary bracket uh, has almost disappeared. And there's some other uh, features that have drifted as well. We can see that the loans of the cars that have uh, gotten some requests has gone up as well. Um, and this is probably a feature that has a lot of impact because this is whether the customer was able to repay uh, a previous loan. And we see that actually that part has gone down uh, as well. And then there is here a feature that has some false positives. Uh, before delving into that, I'll quickly finish the story what we can do with the previous alerts that we got. So we narrowed it down um, to like a few core alerts. Um, and then it's, it's up to the data scientists to piece these information together um, and come up with a plausible story and to actually um, reason why this happens and how it is caused. And the reason why it has to be a data scientist doing this is because this just requires business insight. Uh, and machine learning models are often uh, embedded in business processes and generating machine learning model outputs is usually not the end point. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that can happen after. And for this, it might be, um, it ha might have something to do with the car market, um, or it might something have to do with COVID or how the customer preferences have changed. And it's really something that the data scientists have to figure out from that perspective and maybe also have a look downstream of what happens with the what with these predictions, were there any promotion campaigns, how do the agents that uh, sell car loans, um, how do they deal with this? Um, and that's basically where the data science com comes in. A quick word about this, because this is one of these things where you can have a few data drift alerts, but if they don't go inside with an expected drop in performance, this might actually be either randomness or uh, not just relevant for what we're doing. And it's these type of alerts that we try to figure out. And that's it uh, of my quick story. I'll stop sharing. Just wondering, um, like when you do this sort of visualization, I noticed that you always have the timestamp. So you always have time. Like if yeah. I want to do similar an, uh, analysis, similar analytics, do I have to have the time uh, column in my data frame? Um, so, um, the unique thing about NaniML right now is that we really look at it from a temporal perspective. So really how things change over time. If you just want to approach it from the, from the way that you say, I consider all my production data the same, and I just want to see how it compares to the training data, then you can, you don't have to provide a timestamp and you can literally distinguish, um, by just the partition itself. Mm -hmm. But it's very important to bear in mind that how you calculate performance, for instance, one of the things that we run into with NaniML, it's also a, a, a way of sampling how the data gets generated every month. And that might actually impact um, the bounds in which the performance might lay before you can consider it a real drop in performance. And if you only take one timestamp, you cannot really have like a very accurate measure of what um those bounds might be mm -hmm. okay so it's it's anyways important to lock the timestamp as well right when you record all yeah that. exactly so. okay and, uh, it's open source right yeah it's open source uh what we're doing right now it's actually because we only open source like very recent uh right now we're trying to get the word out uh, and doing, getting some reads and some visibility, talking to our friends, sharing it on LinkedIn and telling, Hey, everybody, mm -hmm. none emails open source. We're working on it with 11 people. Mm -hmm. uh, please come check it out. And there's, there's various ways to con contribute as well. Uh, right now, our doc, our, our docs still need a lot of work. Um, 
but there's also issues and, and ways of, uh, we have like a small uh, description of how you can take uh, some of the issues and quickly resolve them and then uh, do a pull request. Mm -hmm. So you kind of answered two questions that I had about how many people work on this and how people contribute. Maybe can you quickly give us a tour around your GitHub page? Like if somebody, let's say, wants to contribute, uh, they go to issues. Are there good first issues, for example? Ah, uh, no, absolutely not. not we yet. have not, uh, <laughs> not yet, no. Um, <laughs> so like, like, like I said, it, it's just very, very recent. Uh, I think that right now there's only like one issue open. Okay. Um, so the, the whole is idea is to, ah, uh, it's a good first issue. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, all issues, because there aren't so much, if they get open, they just get resolved immediately. Mm -hmm. Um, but the whole idea is that that is still, uh, coming up in the next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, show people how they can give you a star. Um, I'll quickly. <laughs> Because I think uh, uh, it's, uh, this one again. it's great that you do this in open source. Sure. It's, it's really great that you made this decision and you deserve a star. So it's uh, github nannyml slash nannyml, right? Exactly. And this is the place. And then here at the top click. corner, you can drop a yeah. star. And here there is a, we actually spent some time on our readme recently because that is something that people look at first. Um, so I also suggest this to start there and have a look. Uh, but the whole the whole reason why we actually open sourced um, is that we we wanted to solve this problem uh, about post deployment data science and machine learning models uh, failing, but we didn't have any preconceived idea of how we were going to go about it. So we spent a lot of time talking to data scientists, and we just realized that this is really what data scientists want. They want to see how the algorithms work. They want to um, have some confidence in them and, and understand them very deeply. And for that, you need to be open source. And also we actually, as people and as founders, uh, we don't wanna call things a black box or a secret sauce. We just wanna talk about them, communicate about them and how they work. Uh, and we also really, really strongly believe that the way you build these types of tools is by collaborating with others. And specifically for what we're building right now, because we only have actually like really one um, very experienced engineer that kind of helps us, but all of the rest of the contributors are data scientists. And today there is not really like a um, structured way for data scientists to contribute uh, open source with research. Okay, you have, uh, have Kaggle where there's a lot of data sets that are open source and that where you can do a little bit of machine learning. But, but what NannyML tackles is it's, um, it's really different because it's production data. So it's not just one snapshot of a data set in time, but it's really multiple snapshots on time on which you have to do machine learning, uh, model building and, and, and training various models. And every data set becomes one data point in validating your algorithm. So we're probably also actually coming up with a way that it's easier for data scientists uh, to contribute with research and insights and analysis. Okay, I hope it's clear how to start. <laughs> yeah. Um... What are your plans? What do you want to work on next? Um, so what we want to work on next is like, we have a lot of people asking, hey, why are you guys not covering regress regression yet? So right now we're supporting classification and, and uh, binary and multi-class. So that is probably one of the things that we're um, going to work on in the next few months. Uh, short term, it's getting the visibility out, but there are also some other more research pro projects that we have in mind. Um, remember that I said we have to link data drift back to performance. Um, that is performing some type of root cause analysis that will need, need, need some deep data science research. And then this algorithm that we have right now, uh, the CBPE, the confidence-based performance estimation, it actually makes an assumption that there is no concept drift. Uh, and when concept drift happens and occurs, um, after, after your machine learning model deploys, it really, really messes with a lot of things. So we're also developing algorithms to kind of detect that. So those are so really the things that, that are on our mind today. And of course, it's it's making better documentation, better uh, communication around the library itself and, and the overall usability of it. Yeah, great. Do you have any advice for anyone who is watching this? 
Ah, it's uh, interesting. Like about data science advice or founder advice or life, life advice, advice uh, founder advice, data science advice. I don't know, dating advice, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll start with the dating advice. Uh, no, no. I think actually for um, data data science advice, I do have something um, because I used to be like just a data scientist, and and I noticed that actually it's, it's something we learned from our users. Data scientists that have experienced model failure once, they just completely change how they look at data science. Uh, even this morning, I spoke to spoke to a user um, that said that what keeps him up at night is really his models failing. Um, and because he had one model failure and their data science department was very close to the, to the actual department that was consuming the predictions from a business perspective. And it's literally when it failed, people from business came running to him and they said like, everything is going down, what's happening? And it really has PTSD about that. And people that have experienced that actually also start changing the way they do data science. So I would say, yes, learn about how to build very advanced machine learning models and see how all of these different parameters come together and how you can really, really push the boundary of your, of your models. So, but also deploy it and also see how your machine learning models start behaving over time, how they deteriorate, and then maybe take a step back and start building more robust or more simpler models. Okay. So would you recommend anyone to first experience uh, model failure? And then <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Yes, I would, I would, I would, I would actually, yes. Maybe, but you better have to 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 have a safe environment for that, right? So that business yes. people do not uh, run chasing you. Exactly, you. but yeah. yes, but I think yeah, um, the best way to learn is is by failing. So I would for sure, but if you if you can learn from other people's mistake, uh, do that of course. Maybe follow our blogs because we're going to be writing about this a lot in the coming weeks where we hope we can convey a lot of this information because we've experienced a lot of machine learning model failures. Uh, and that's also what we've basically, the information we've been gathering from our users over the past uh, year and a half, like basically our journey, is always about that as well. And, and there's some very, very interesting stories. Okay. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for doing demo. Thanks for the advice you gave. And yeah, we'll, I will include all the links and uh, just check the description and don't forget to give a star. Thank you very much, Alexei. And also just in general, I love what you're doing with spotlighting open source. Uh, so best of luck with that. Thank you.